so good morning everyone and thank you for joining us in this uh, NAMG workshop week um, uh, I hope you are all doing well and enjoying so far um, Imad talked to you a little bit about this introduction to molecular dynamics and also um, a little bit about what you can do with it, you know, like actually quite a lot about what you can do with it, and which I think is very nice. You, you, you might have now an idea about the kind of things you can study with MD. Uh, what I'm going to try to do right now is to help you with um, two different things. Number one is trying to set up the simulations more easily. And also, I'm going to show you some of the ideas that we have about making it easier to reproduce simulations later, like trying to tackle the, this reproducibility problem that we have typically in molecular dynamic simulations. Okay, so the first step is, uh, so then what I'm gonna talk about is QuickMD, which is our main tool for, for doing that. Um, yeah, first step is like, when we look at a molecular dynamic simulation, we always talked about the molecular dynamics force field and it was supposed to play. There we go. Uh, so what you have in a molecular dynamics force field is that you have a, a control over like the bonds that you have in a molecule, like you use a, 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 a hook potential to, to represent what a bond is. You have another kind of hook potential to represent what an angle in a bond is. You have another one to represent torsion. You have an X, another one to represent a dihedral. So like right now I'm showing one of the torsion ones. So like how you can represent distortions in a, in a protein. Uh, the next one shows how you can keep planarity, like in the dihedral, like when you have four atoms connected and then you need to keep the plane, like for instance, in the, in the ring, or if you have a terminal, you need to keep this kind of pyramidal shape in the, in the, in the terminal. Uh, the next potential is about like the, these were all the places we're talking so far is like the bonded potential. Then we have non-bonded potentials that are the lunge, uh, then our Jones potential and also uh, the electrostatic potentials. Uh, we don't calculate them for your nearest neighbors. We always calculate them to, to atoms that are a little bit farther away. And that's because the nearest neighbors are going to be connected using uh, the, the bonded potentials. And then combining all of them, what you have is the, the, the force field that we use to move molecules like you're seeing right now. And then that's basically how like that's kind of the physics that is behind to move these atoms, then we are gonna use uh, just like solving Newton's equation of motion. We're gonna go just set them to move uh, basically like in a very short interval of time. The interval of time depends on a lot of parameters, but like the main reason like you need to make sure that you're counting for all the vibrations that you have, particularly in the uh, initial like the bone vibration, which is the fastest movement that you have. Okay. Uh, another thing that you need to, to take into consideration is that when you're simulating these things, if you have just one box that you're simulating and you uh, just think about that only box, you're gonna have border problems. You're gonna have walls that are gonna end. And what is this end, you know? So what you do then is to use periodic boundary condition, which is a method to try to create an, an infinity size box. Basically what happened is, if some molecule goes out in one end, there's my mouse. You, so if one molecule goes, goes out in one end, it goes back in the other end. So basically any molecule that is in the interface, it goes and it's go, gonna come out on the other side. By doing that, you kind of ensure that this is like any molecule can walk for an infinity distance, like forever, and, and that's never gonna end. Like the box is kind of unlimited in size at the end of the day. And that's kind of the, 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 the idea that you have. But what you do to do that is basically you have, for every time you're calculating, you're actually calculating copies of the systems around you. you. You don't actually copy the copies, you have a way of cutting that off, but it's that's, that's basically what you have. Uh, next, let me just mute something here. My, my Slack is calling my attention more than it should. Uh, so 
okay, you have periodic boundary conditions now, but like what kind of simulations can we do? What kind of uh, ensembles can we simulate? And uh, typically when we talk about MD, we are we're gonna talk about three different ensembles. One of them is the constant volume and constant energy like NVE. That's, that's the main uh, ensemble that you use when you wanna to study uh, like if energy is conserved in your system, if, if the system is equilibrated, that's the way you can do it. Uh, constant temperature and constant volume, that's another one we typically use uh, mostly, I would say, in equilibration simulations. Like that's also frequently used in the production runs, but more, more, more in the equilibration kind of stage. And then you have constant temperature and constant pressure, NPT. And that one, I would say, is the most used uh, ensemble that we have like we, we use it like in MD typically, okay? The kind of ensemble that you're gonna choose really depends on what you wanna study. Uh, for most cases, NPT, like I say, is the main most used ensemble, but you might need NV and NVT for the, depending on this, what you're doing, okay? Okay, so the other first problem that we have is when we initially start a simulation, we have a system that is out of the position that it should be, right? Like when you when you crystallize a protein, for instance, and you want to simulate a protein, the, the atoms in that protein are not exactly where they would be at the room temperature, solvated, and in a different condition than what they were crystallized at. So the crystallization step is, you actually influence quite a lot, like small details of the protein by adding a different buffer, a different temperature, a different condition that is gonna be necessary to crystallize a protein, but it's gonna influence a little bit how the protein actually looks like. So when you start the simulation, you are you might be might be in this high energy position here that you need to go down to a more stable conformation. Also, you need to remember that when you start from a crystal, you don't have the position of the hydrogen atoms. You don't you might have some clashes that are coming from missing parts or parts that were not solved correctly. So all of that are gonna come, are gonna be, uh, are gonna be in, in a conformation that is high energy, and then you're gonna use this minimization step to minimize and go to a local minima. So when you do that, you end up finding uh, your my mouse again disappeared. You you're gonna find one local minima, then you can continue doing these steps. You're gonna end up finding another minima that might be your global minima, which is typically not the case, you're gonna find some local minimum that is much deeper than the region around. So you're gonna be here, and then if you do MD simulations, typically you're gonna be trapped inside this because it costs a lot of energy to actually jump out. But depending on how you do it, if you do it for a long time, you're gonna have a higher chance of jumping out of those pockets, and then you can sample actually slightly different conformations, not necessarily going back, and it's kind of, you might be trapped, let's say, in a formation that is not perfect, but you also uh, need to sample enough so that you're gonna sample different conformations. So for that, actually, you're gonna have a whole day tomorrow about learning how to use free energy kind of methods, enhanced sampling kind of methods to, to search for these conformations and also see, uh, and also run a simulation where you can jump between them. You know, you, you, can, you can select how to convert a system from one of these minima to another one, uh, like going from here to here or going back or or maybe jumping all the way to the last one or staying in one like there are methods that you can use to sample these conformations when i talk about these conformations it can be like imad was showing some channel opening and closing can be many different things that you can sample in these conformations okay another problem is that we, you can imagine is like okay you show me this uh force field parameters they're all classical and, and one of the things that we here all the time is like why you're not using quantum mechanics you know, you know enough quantum mechanics by now to use it for for this kind of simulation and the main problem is the time so the, the larger the size of the system that we are interested in the, the the smallest the amount of time we can actually simulate using quantum mechanics so quantum, quantum mechanics so if you have a a system that you simulate with classical mechanics you can have a large systems and it's going to cost you very little the computer if you go to very high level Cuban methods, that's gonna take a lot of time, but then, and you also can only study very small systems. So it really depends on the question. It really depends on what you wanna study. So in, 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 in a sort of way, like what, you, what I'm trying to explain is that there is a time scale problem that 
It depends on the problem, that, it depends on the system that you want to study, it depends on the problem that you want to study, you're going to select the method. You might use classical MD, you might use cross grained MD, like Imad was talking about. You can also use hybrid QMMM simulation, or you can use pure QM simulations. And, that, and they are going to allow you to simulate different time scales. You know, like you might be, if you are interested in something that happens in the femtosecond time scale, pure QM is fine. But if you're interested in something that happened in millisecond time scale, you, you're going to need cross grained MD or some tricks to do classical MD. Okay. And the QMMM, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to talk about that on Friday, but what you have is a region of your system is being simulated with quantum mechanics, while the rest of the system is simulated with classical mechanics. And by doing that, you're able to study, for instance, a chemical reaction in the QM part and, and have the rest of the system being simulated with the classical mechanics because you don't need the like the high level details of quantum mechanics to study the rest of the system, but you need the influence that they make on the catalytic side, on, on, the, on, the, on, yeah, on, the, on the on the cleavage point or whatever that you have there happening in the, in the McEwen region. Okay. Uh, okay, but then uh, that was a lot of introduction to get where I wanted to get, which was talk about QuickMD. So what is QuickMD? Um, a few years ago, we, we, I, I was in Illinois at the time, and I was at the, the center working with Paul Schulten, and we had this idea about a way of making MD easier for most people. And the, our main idea was we need to make it easier and then easier to reproduce. Like the, it came from a, a discussion about two main problems that we had. Number one is it's not easy for new users to start an MD simulation. And second, um, it's not easy to reproduce MD simulations. And that's like, it's true for any code. It's not a, it's not an MD thing. It's not a, it, it's not a, a Gromax thing. It's not a, it's, it's for every code. You know, like all of them, they're not so easy to use. And second, they're not so easy to reproduce, you know, like when you do simulations with it. So what we did then, so was to create a code program that would help setting up MD simulations, offer a both a simple and an advanced interface that would allow you to do basically any kind of method that is available in MD, test the structure for missing loops, parameters, et cetera, like trying to find problems that we see that get all the way to the point that the papers are submitted. And, and one of us is sometimes reading these papers and like, like being the reviewer and like, okay, you know, like you did something very wrong in the beginning and you didn't notice and, and that's gonna affect the results. You know, like we want to avoid those problems. Also, we want to have a live view interface for testing and teaching, which is cool. You know, like you can show how molecular dynamics works to people, and you can also test if something is going wrong with your system. You can see it live, and include an, a, an interface for analysis of MD trajectories. Okay. Uh, how is it going to look like? That was our initial idea, like, and, and we decided to make something like this. And then, uh, when we created the idea, we we got uh, João Ribeiro to join us to help to create this interface. And the interface looks somewhat like this. You have uh, a window where you select what parts of the proteins you want to study. You want to select the protocols. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that. And you can select also the parts of the structure that you're interested in and, and, and the problems that you might have with it. Like it can show you some problems. And we're going to see that in more detail now. OK, so but before we get there, why I was saying this is complicated, why I was saying this is too complicated for us to do. Uh, the NMD config file is not easy. You know, that's, that's the first problem. And, and honestly, like in my personal opinion, it's easier than some other codes. Uh, in an NMD config file, you're gonna have inputs like what's your structure, like your PSF file, what are the coordinates that you're simulating, what's the temperature, and then you're gonna also have what's the input name, if you're continuing from, from other simulations, you're gonna need the, the coordinates from the last simulation, you're gonna need the velocity from the last simulation, but you're gonna say what the first step is, the number of steps, and you're gonna select the parameters for the outputs, parameters for energy, parameters for the force fields, like is this a charm force field, is it not charm force field, what kind of parameters, what kind of cutoff, what kind of parallel distance that you're gonna have, number of steps per cycle, the time step that you're gonna do, are you using rigid bonds or not? Are you using, like, there are so many parameters, you know, there are so many things. And at the end of the day, let's be honest, most people that are using these programs don't know in details what these parameters mean. And so we needed to create a way of solving this problem. And, and 
and, and QuickMD for us was the answer. There are other people trying different, slightly different things. Like there are some discussions about maybe uh, creating a tolerance error, and then you just say the tolerance and all the problems are set automatically. You know, there are some ideas out there of people thinking about how can we make it simple for the user, okay? So here, just another few examples, like, like in NAMD, for instance, you're gonna use Langevin, and then you're gonna, this is what Langevin looks like. And then you're gonna, like, do you know what Langevin means? Like, do you, like people in general don't, you know, like uh, for instance, like you, in Langevin, you have a dumping parameter. You have a parameter that's gonna be affected randomly depending on, on, on uh, it, it's basically like a friction of the system somewhat. And this dumping parameter, and, and this dumping parameter comes, uh, it comes with a, a random number generator that depends on when you, like on the, like every time you run, it's different the random number generator. So even if you start simulation from the same starting point, name is not gonna give you the same number at the end because of this, because it's using Langevin, it's not doing other kind of deterministic methods. So all of that, most users don't know how to set up correctly. So. Again, the cell bases, wrapping, there are some other tools. So let's create QuickMD. Let's make QuickMD easy for everybody. How, how do we do that? What do we need to make it simple for people to simulate, um, do molecular dynamic simulation? So the first step, let's create this molecular biophysics kit. And it's gonna have, the first thing we did was let's create, uh, what is the workflow of an MD simulation? And then let's go step by step and do QuickMD, make QuickMD to help us in every step. The first step is in the structure. Let's get the structure from the prolate in the bank. Next step, you need to select what part of that structure that you want to simulate. Uh, if you have an NMR structure, you might have multiple steps. If you have a crystal, like a crystal structure, or even an NMR structure, you might have more than one part of the protein that you want to study. Like might be two domains, you're only interested in one. Or it might be a dimer, you need to build the dimer, or it might be a dimer that is only a monomer that you're interested in. So you need to select the part of the model that you want to study. Then let's check the structure. For instance, are there gaps? Um, are there parameters missing? Like, uh, is there something there that is different than the standard charm force field parameter that we are used to? So we can just gonna check for that. Then we make nice representations so that automatically, so that you can look at it like, oh yeah, everything looks correct or no, there's something here that looks wrong. Let's change it. And, and all of that helps you to decide if you should start your simulation or not. Next step is I'm interested in mutations. Like actually the system that I want to study, it's not, it's not a glycine here, it's an alanine. So let's change the glycine to an alanine. So let's create a tool to do that. Protonation state, you know, uh, by my histidines are delta, epsilon, or protonated. You know, like where, where is the proton in the histidine? You need to select the point. Let's solve it, you know, simulate the system. You need to solve the system. Is the solvation just water? You want a membrane? You want to put in a membrane? We can do that too. You need to select the salt concentration. You need to select like the, if it's going to be NaCl, it's going to be potassium Cl, it's going to be something else like it's, these, these options are available in PMD. Why not make that easy to select? Select, select the protocols. I'm just going to do MD. I want to do SMD. I want to do QMMM. I want to do a free energy kind of calculation. What, what can I do? Like, and you need to select those, those methods here. And then you're going to prepare all the files. And that's the part that so far, like you're just selecting everything and trying to find if there was a problem or not. When you prepare the files, you actually generate two folders in your computer. One of them you're gonna call a setup folder. The other one is a run folder. The setup folder is gonna have every single thing that was needed to build that system. And the run folder, every single thing you need to run that system. So the setup folder is gonna have you in the scripts that can generate that again, to make it easier for you to do it again in case you need. The run folder, it's gonna be self-containing. Like if you need to run that system in a supercomputer, you just move that folder to the supercomputer, or copy that folder to the supercomputer you can run. When you run, we want to create two, three ways of running it. You can run in your computer. You can run live, like I said before. You can run in your computer and watch it at the same time. And you can also copy the files to your supercomputer to, to run there and bring the results back. And also, we want to create a lot live analysis methods, like analysis tool that you could, if you're running the simulation live, you could check for the system at the same time. 
and also some advanced analysis that can help you with more complicated steps afterwards. Okay, so that was the idea behind QuickMD. QuickMD tried to follow this workflow step by step and help you to build your, your simulation step by step. This is how it looks like. So in this easy run tab, you can come here, type your PDB, like for instance, you can browse if it's in your computer, your a crystallographer, you wanna bring it from your computer, or you wanna just type here the PDB code and, and, and click load, it loads. Like if you just say one UBQ, for instance, like this ubiquity, it loads ubiquity from the Prolin data bank. If it's NMR, you can select the state, like there's many states typically. If like, like in this case, you can select the chain, and the chain in this case could be like there's protein and water in the ubiquity and you might say, I just want the protein. I don't care about the crystallographic waters. When you come to structure manipulation, you can say, I want to mutate this leucine to a, a tunine. I want to I, I want to see the serine here. I'm going to change it to a histidine or I want to change it to a glutamate, whatever I want. I want to change the protonation state. Uh, you can come, you can also check what the secondary structure look like by checking, comparing to this table here. So this part of the protein is a bit extended. This part of the protein, it's a turn. You can see all of that at the same time you're doing it. It checks for the parameters. It's like in this case here, you're saying like there's all the topologies and parameters are okay. All chiral centers are okay. There are no sequence gaps. Uh, it's seeing that the torsion angles, there are more outliers than typical. It's just telling you that this is, might be a problem, like it's not causing any problem. You can continue to run. And the torsion angles are also like things all correct. And it's all this is automated, like it selects everything for you. Um, then next, you can select uh, what kind of parameter you want to simulate. You want to do MD or STIR, like that's the easy run. The advanced run has more options. And then you want to do explicit solvent. This is the salt concentration you want. Remember, this is the easy run, has less options. Um, then the protocol, you want to select, like I want to do equilibration, I want to do MD. This is the temperature you want to simulate. This is how much time I want to simulate. And then you're going to say, where is the folder you're going to save this? You hit repair. Like in this case, I'm doing the live view mode. And when you start equilibration, you can run and see the system running. Okay. Next, you can also analyze the system. You can come to this basic analysis, see total energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, RMSD, many other things at the same time. You're all plotting at the same time, and you can watch that live while you run in the simulation. Uh, in the advanced run, you can also do some extra analysis. And all of that is, like, like you can see, is relatively easy to use. We also want to make it even easier to use, like more accessible by creating info buttons. So we go through these protocols, but like every time, if you go back there and see, you always have this info button on the, on the side. That tells you what is being done, and that tells you also many times, it's not as complete, let's say, as we want it to be. I hope one day it will be, uh, but it shows you, for instance, oh, you're using Langevin. This is the citation for Langevin. You're using PME. This is the citation for PME. You want to use, this is what it means, this method. This is what it means, that other method. This is a link for the paper that actually developed that method. Like, so you want to give this information so that you can know what you're doing, decide better what you want to do. Okay? And after that, okay, well, the other part, like I mentioned a little bit before, we want to make it reproducible. We want to make the reprodu re reproducibility a big part of, of QuickMD. And we want to make QuickMD not a black box. You know, like, although it looks like a black box when I say you're just clicking on buttons, the idea of that it's not a black box is because we have two log files that are very complete. Number one, there is a TCL based log file, which is a script. It's all the scripts that were done. Everything that was done inside QuickMD, it's saved as a script at the end. So by doing that, you, you can basically do everything again. You can run all the simulations again. You can see exactly what was done. So therefore not a black box. Second, we have a text file that one day we hope, it's not that good yet, but like one day we hope this is gonna be the method session of your paper. It's gonna be written for you, just copy and paste. You know, but it, it, it comes right now somewhat like that. It gives you some sentence, like you select this method, that method, this other method, this is a citation for that specific method, like, oh, you're using PME, this is a citation for PME. You're using uh, uh, Langevin, this is a citation for Langevin. So all this stuff, it's coming like in a, in a file, in a text file that you can just use, and that's easier for you to just copy for your method session of your paper. Okay? Uh, this other TCL file, for instance, for reproducibility, you can send that as a supplementary material for your paper. You know, like you're writing a paper, you want to 
prove that what you think you're doing, like you're gonna certify, like it's easy to reproduce what I did. Here it is, this is my TCL file that has everything, like all the steps to reproduce everything that I did. And I, I cannot see anyone complaining that if you have reproducibility problems with your paper, if you do that. Okay. What can you do with that? So these are outdated numbers compared to the hard we have today, but it gives you some idea, you know, like in terms of uh, how much I can simulate with it. Uh, so this is, uh, for instance, like if you're using a laptop, like a laptop from 2013, which is a relatively old laptop, this is how many seconds per day you could do with an MD that we had in 2016. So it's, it's actually much better today. But that's to give you this idea, like, oh, if I have simple computers, I don't have awesome supercomputers to run my simulation. You can actually do a lot using a regular kind of desktop, you know, like with an NVIDIA GTX Titan X here, which is like an old kind of GPU card. Or if you're using cloud systems, like Amazon cloud system, how much you can do with those systems, depending on the size of the system, the, the, the computer system, depending on the size of the protein system here. Okay. And of course, that's uh, nothing compared to what you can do using a supercomputer. Uh, a few years ago, we, we went through what I'm, I'm calling here the PDSK revolution, when we started to actually get supercomputer centers that were in the PDSK level, like this one, for instance, is in Illinois, uh, not far from where the, the center that develops MVMD, VMD is. And in that supercomputer center where, where Blue Waters is, uh, a lot of uh, like a lot of large simulations were, were were performed. For instance, people were able to simulate for the first time the HIV capsid, uh, which uh, was done by my colleague there, uh, Juan Perilla, who is now Delaware. And this is one example of like a huge system, like with 64 million atoms, that could be studied using uh, a peta, a peta scale kind of computer. Of course, uh, now we are going to another revolution that we call the exascale computing revolution. But that brings also a lot of new challenges, like how these new computers look like. Are them using the same kind of architecture? Um, are there software challenges, like in terms of the development of the software? Uh, and like there are many things that we are actually doing right now to make NAMD VMD we can be everything available in this new supercomputer, this new style of computers. And but I think the best news for for most of us, like not the people, like there are very few people that are actually going to have access to this kind of access scale computing soon. But for most of us, the, the good news is better scale computing is dropping. The cost is dropping a lot. And, and if you were able to simulate whole virus capsules with like 64 million atoms or even like 100 million atom systems with better scale, it's great that better scale is, is much cheaper now. And one example of that is this computer that is called a DGX A100 from NVIDIA, which is a highly parallel GPU computing node with, uh, it, like, it's capable of doing five petaflops. So like the whole blue waters that was shown before, I think it's 21 or 14. I don't remember for sure right now. So just one of these, it's five petaflops. So like this is equivalent to a whole supercomputer from less than 10 years ago. You know, so it, it's amazing how much these things evolve. And like we have some of these here at Auburn. We have three of them actually. Like in Illinois, there's another one of the previous version and we are trying to get some of the newer version. But like what you can do with that is amazing. Like we now can do million atom kind of system doing like 164 nanoseconds per day in one node, in one machine. And that's because we're still optimizing our code. You know, like we, we can probably do a little bit better than that. And, and this gives you an idea about how much you can do with this new kind of hardware. Uh, like this is another benchmark using the new version of NAMD3 that you're gonna hear about this week more. Uh, if you have a, a, RT, a, a RTX uh, 3090, which is a which is a gaming kind of card, I know it's a hard to get and not so cheap one, but it's it's uh, it's a gaming card. You can do quite a lot actually. Like if you have a system of like about 200,000 atoms, which is what most people do, you have two of them connected. You're gonna you can do like 260 nanoseconds per day, like with only one node, with only one computer. So that's actually pretty impressive about this new. Uh, kind of hardware that we have today. Um, before I continue, like I, I've been talking a lot and I see no questions so far. Are there questions? Are there any people? I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see anyone raising hands. So, nope. Okay, so 
if you have any question, please raise your hand or, or, or ask in the chat, I can answer. So what can we do with QuickMD then? Uh, what, but specifically what, okay, we have a question, yes. Hello, thanks for your presentation. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, this uh, um, quick MD, yeah. if I pronounce it uh, properly, uh, is only for uh, an MD, yes, and VMD. Yeah. It's not usable for other programs like Chromax, Amber. Uh, not yet, not yes, that's true. It's so far, it's only for an MD. Okay, um, do you think in future uh, it become available for other codes or Yeah, that's maybe actually it's should... part of our plan. Like, uh, uh, I'm gonna show a little bit later what we're working on right now in terms of development. And, and that's, yes. that's part of the plan to make it available to other codes. Okay, thanks a lot. Great. No problem. Any other questions? Okay, so continuing, if you, again, if you have questions, please interrupt me. Uh, what specifically my lab here is doing, and I, and I saw someone asking earlier, uh, Emad, about SMD, and that's why I, like uh, mechanical properties of molecules, and that's actually what I do. Uh, what I do is uh, I, I go a little bit forward, like, and I don't really call it SMD anymore myself. Like I've been calling it in silico single model. Oh yes, I have another question. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah, can you go to the previous slide, please? Sorry? Oh, previous slide, yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah, the kind of sampling you're saying for a day, uh, is it possible for uh, for us, like with normal computers, or we you want to use that, that sort of uh, hardware? What, what what do you mean by normal computers and because this is a normal computer <laughs> it's it's just an expensive one but it's a like the, the left hand side is an rtx 3090 which is a gaming card so it's a gaming kind of computer okay 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 so that, that it, usually, usually what i hear from the average md users is that yeah. the kind they don't get the that kind of sampling or uh, it is not that efficient as other programs yeah but that's what you but what I hear from you is totally different story. Yeah, it's true. Because here's the deal. There are two reasons for that. Number one is, the, the main one is there's a lot of lies out there in terms of which program is faster, which program is not. Like if you compare Gromax, Ember, and NAMD, they're pretty much the same speed. The main difference when you see difference in speed is what kind of parameters you're putting in your config file. Most Ember benchmarks, that, which is the main, the fastest code that you see typically, are done in four tenths of second time step, eight angstroms cut off, switching is off, paralysis is, is relatively small, full electrostatic every two steps. Like, so if you select the same parameter, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. If you select okay. Ember parameters and use in, in MD, it's about the same speed. Okay, Should you that. run production runs with those parameters? I would say no. Okay, I don't trust okay, parameters. I don't trust these parameters. And there are okay. papers out there that explain how can you, how much you can trust them. Like there is a very good paper from JC Goombard Group where they test four tenths of second time step and also smaller cutoffs. And they show that four tenths of second time step is okay, but like smaller cutoffs give you wrong results, at least for membrane systems. Obviously, obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then here, here is the deal. If you want to compare benchmarks, that's why I'm showing you these numbers, because I'm trying to show you that if you run the same parameters like they do, <laughs> we get the same results. <laughs> yeah, I understood, I understood that, yeah. But like if you want to do smaller and like the previous plot, I think it's really clear. If you use the blue line here is what I would say, that's safe. Red line is the conservative one. It's the same hardware, so it's the same system. But this is like running like Ember, running like I'd say it's safer, and this is running like very safe, you know, the most conservative yeah. way of running. And that's yeah, probably the yeah, yeah. difference that you're talking about. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, got that, got that, got that, thank you. Yeah. So, but then it also comes to the point where, is it better to run less with this one or more with that one? You know, like that, this really depends on the system. 
and, and I can show you, I can tell you that from my own experience that a lot of the times you need more sampling and, and then like doing shortcuts like this one, like, like the embers like kind of style, it's, it's totally fine. So it really depends on the system. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I understood that. Thank you. We have another one. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm interested with this number. I mean, this is a good number. And then yeah. uh, my question is, uh, we're talking about the quick MD. So I try a couple of quick MD in the Linux system and then the Windows yeah. system. It's a, it's a fine. Okay. But it's a different in the Mac OS because uh, in my case, I try in the latest Mac OS, the Big Sur. It's kind of a, there's some like a force clause or something. But I don't know, it's kind of an error. But the, my question is the flexibility of this software. I mean, did you thinking about it for the next, next? So it, it was always thought about it being useful in both Mac, Linux, and Windows. It's yes. supposed to work in all of them. We have quite a few problems with the new Macs, with the M1s. It's not related to quick MD, it's related to the whole DMD mm -hmm. and every other software out there. <laughs> M1s are a new beast. Uh, yeah, exactly. Today yeah, so yeah, we, them. I cannot tell you anything specifically because this problem goes much beyond QuickMDs. It's not a QuickMD problem. It's a, it's a, it's a whole like community kind of problem. Like, like all softwares are having similar problems and we have this problem with many different softwares here locally because all our local computers here are M1 Macs. Uh, okay. However, all our main computers are Linux and we don't have a single problem in them. So it's, uh, it, it is tough. Like, I, I, I don't know exactly what to tell in terms of when this will be solved. I think you're going to have a talk from, um, from Johnstone this week. Okay. And if you have, like, that's a question that you could ask him because he's the main developer of EMD. He can tell you some other things about it. Okay, thank you. It's no good problem. to hear that. Yeah. And the other question we have here is like, when do you expect an official release of MD3? So the, official, the, the release up there right now is official. It's just, um, it's, it's an alpha version that is gonna last for some time. Like we are using VMD in alpha version also for quite some time now. Um, a version that is not gonna have an alpha beta in front it, it's still gonna take some time because we wanna have, it's not because there's anything wrong with the current version, it's just because we are still working on developing um, all the capabilities into the MD3. And that's the main reason. You know, we wanna have an MD3 that can support more things, more features. And when we get to a point where we have enough features, we are gonna release it as a official MD3 version. And someone was asking about the JC Gombert paper. I don't remember the title of the paper, but there is a paper from his group that talks about fourth and second time step. It's not so old. It's from like three, four years ago, maximum. Sorry. Any other question? So moving on. Uh, so what, like I was saying before, like what, what my group is actually doing using what, what, what my research is actually at, uh, I'm interested in serial molecular dynamics. I'm interested in mechanical proteins. I'm interested in mechanical properties of proteins, exactly what the person was asking about the question before. Uh, I do what I've been calling silico single molecule for spectroscopy, which is basically SMD with a bunch of replicas. You know, like, and, and basically what I try to do is should exactly what the experiments are doing. And by doing that, so what I'm doing is I have the same kind of simulation, I have the same kind of system that I'm showing here, but like I, I'm pulling the two system, the system apart to break it and study mechanical properties of the system. You have to remember that at the time, at the end, I'm doing that while I'm still simulating the whole thing. I'm simulating the system, how like all the water molecules, I'm simulating all the atoms of the proteins. I'm, I'm looking at everything at the same time while I pull the system up. And I showed this plot before, what I was showing like what the potential looks like. When you're doing this kind of SMD, what we do, we have an extra force. 
And this extra force, and I'm going to show you in a very simple way, is, is at the end of the day, is just a, uh, okay, this is how you do the, the, the dynamics. And I, I do this extra potential, which is just the hook potential. So when I'm calculating the force, I'm actually adding a spring to the system, and I'm pulling that spring, and I'm not tracking, because I know the K of the spring, I'm tracking how much the spring move, like what's delta X, what's the displacement of the spring. And by doing that, I can recover the force, and by then I can recover the energy. And by doing that, I can check how the system reacts to force exactly the same way you would do with an AFM, with a, with a tweezer, or you, or even with like a, a centrifugal force microscopy now. Okay. When I started studying the system, I, I, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in, in strong system. I started to study them in 2014. Uh, we could separate the, the, the realm of mechanical proteins into proteins that were weak, most of the proteins below 100 piconewtons of force for rupturing or for unfolding. Some proteins were very strong, like strep avidine biotin, which is a complex for that's using a lot, there's a lot in biotechnology and it ranges between like 100 and 400 piconewtons. There is a problem in how you do the binding, you know, like I, I studied that too. And there were covalent bonds. Like, so if you want to break a covalent bond, that would be somewhat between 2,000 and 4,000 piconewtons. And this is the, this force regime here is in the AFM speed. This is in the speed that you do experiments, okay? Um, when a little bit after I studied that, start to study that, we found another system that was actually stronger than strep avidin biotin, which is a cellulosome kind of strong system. Cellulosomes are those large macromolecular complexes, so they're formed by uh, in the interactions that are not covalent bonds, they're just like protein-protein like interactions, and they're actually very strong, they're huge, that's why they need to be stronger, otherwise it would not be stable. And they're found in, in kind of turbulent environments. So they, again, they need to be stable. Uh, we actually end up finding more cellulosomes that were strong, and some of them actually more recently also in the human gut, which is pretty interesting. And not long ago, a few years ago, we actually found a bacteria adhesion system that was in the same realm of force of the covalent bond without covalent bond. And that's amazingly impressive. Like you can find systems that are as strong as a covalent bond in the, in the uh, like without a covalent bond, like just protein-protein just, just protein interaction. Uh, we studied that system in, in a lot of details and, and we got that published in science a couple of years ago. You, you might look at it if you're interested in mechanics uh, of proteins. Uh, I've been also studying um, the mechanics of SARS-CoV-2 infection, like how uh, the ACE2 interacts uh, with the spike protein. We also do some methods, we develop some methods to calculate force propagation and do network analysis. So you can see how force propagates through the system while you're pulling. You actually use uh, Onzager uh, reciprocal relation to do that. Like that's actually the column book, that the part that no one reads, but read at the end. And by doing that, we were able to map also and understand the interface between uh, RBD and the, the from the spike protein and the IS2 protein and calculate what were the most important resins at the interface. We did that for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Like SARS-CoV-1, if you see the force distribution, it looks like something like this one here for SARS-CoV-2 is this one. So SARS-CoV-2 is actually much stronger than SARS-CoV-1, so which is the, current, the new coronavirus. And we were actually able to create a chimera from SARS-CoV-1 with only eight mutations that would reproduce the properties of SARS-CoV-2. This is something that's still not published, we are working on. And, uh, and all of that was done selecting, like using MD to select. And these are like, we have a lot of experimental data in, in all of them. So these are all tested experimentally. We also did all of that for the, var the variants. So all the variants of concern. So these are like a study of all of them. We're looking into what happens with one of them. We also like my lab studied uh, allosteric communications within other complexes, like for instance, respiratory complex. And we're interested in study how uh, like communication go for this protein, how like a, a, a basically like how energy goes from one part, like you have this in NADH here bound, and then you have a quinone here, how the energy goes through, uh, like you have a lot of transfer actually, like how this goes through, like how the electric communication is inside the, the protein. We also look at many other different systems and and using like, and QuickMD can be used for all of them. You know, like we use that quite frequently actually. Uh, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to go into a hands-on session where I'm going to show a little bit of quick and Do you have any other questions?
No. Rafael, I was planning to do uh, a guided tutorial of Quick ND in the afternoon. So maybe yeah. you want to go over all, like, uh, and I can go a little bit deeper. Okay, sure. Uh, I, I just wanna wanna show you something very quickly that I that I had in mind, and then like I'm, I'm gonna let you do the guided one this afternoon. So that's that's easy. Makes my life easier. <laughs> uh, the only thing that I wanna show pretty quickly is how simple it is to run a, a, a quick MD step. And so like I just opened the MD here. If I go to extension. Uh, Simulation, quick MD, yes. Someone asking a question? Nope. Um, if I go there, I, I'm gonna open the quick MD interface here. If I just type a protein here, any protein, one ubiquitin, ubiquitin, and click load, it's gonna load the protein, it's gonna tell you what it's doing, you know, like it's gonna rename some of the atoms because of the charm force field. For instance, in the charm force field, there is no his for histogen. It needs to be either HSD, HSE, or HSP. P is the protonated version. D and E are the hydrogen in the epsilon uh, nitrogen or the delta nitrogen. And also it's gonna rename the water molecules so that the water atoms, so that it's gonna look like water. And then that's it. Uh, do you have another question? Oh. Then, um, this is QuickMD. Now the system is loaded. So these are the crystallographic water. There's a protein in the back. And let's say I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to let Mariana to explain to you all of that. And if I, I just want to do the fastest thing ever, and I'm going to just let it go here, do just the calibration simulation, I'm going to assume that everything is correct. I'm going to click live view so that you can see. I'm going to go to my test folder here and I'll create something called demo. I'm going to save and it's prepared. So everything is prepared. Mariana is gonna show you this afternoon with more details. But the cool thing is if I just start, start the calibration simulation, let's not use all the computer power here. Let's use 16 processors, click okay. And I'm doing that live. Let's see if it's working. I'm gonna go to basic analysis and I'm gonna plot bond angle, uh, actually, I want kinetic energy and potential energy and calculate. And now, let's hope this works. No, no, no. Good. Did it crash? It was working before, I promise. No, it's running. Yeah, just because I tested it before and it worked, now it's not working. That's sad. It's always like that. Don't worry, I will try to show it in the afternoon and it's gonna probably- Yeah, <laughs> the funny thing is I tested exactly the same thing a few minutes ago so that it would work. Make sure that no problem would happen. We have another question. Yes. Hey there. Um, okay, so I am working on uh, kind of a similar Ubuntu environment on my second mm -hmm. PC here, and a virtual. I, I ran like kind of a virtual machine Ubuntu, and yeah. I wanted to understand that we're working in the same uh, development environment. So, are you? when you loaded in that ubiquitin protein do you have oh. that in a certain folder in like wh which folder or is it like searching the web somehow for that ubiquitin pdb folder? oh it was wasn't it probably data bank i just typed the code you don't need to if it isn't gotcha. a data bank you don't need to do anything you just type the code yeah because i noticed that protein was loaded in the quick md tutorial files that yeah. you were putting on the website but i wasn't sure where i should be getting that okay Thank oh, you. actually, you're getting directly from the data bank. Uh, okay. that's like, awesome. Actually, MDMD, like if you just type, you're seeing my screen, right? Like if you type VMD one ubq, like it loads one ubq. It loads that uh, code, data bank code. Any code that you have from the PDB, you can do that. 
Okay. Thank you. No Any question? I have another question. Hi, Dr. Bernardi. Oh. Um, this is actually Sonal, and I'm the one who asked about the steered molecular dynamics simulation oh, yeah. before. So my lab works on collagen. Um, yeah. We basically do a lot of tissue engineering, but recently we have been studying different mutations. So I was wondering, could you use the quick MD if the structure of the proteins is created using triple helical building script and not from the, uh, and it doesn't have a PDB structure? Yeah, it, it, we actually start a lot of the projects without a PDB structure using like modular, like you, you need, at the end, you need a PDB, right? You need a structure. Yes. If this is coming from the PDB, from the early data bank, or if you're creating one with homology modeling or alpha fold that I'm talking <laughs> later today, it's uh, it's up to you. Like that's that's totally fine. You, you just need a structure you, that you need. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, but like uh, you can do uh, quite a lot just by homology modeling and you, you'll be able to study that. I, I've never heard of it actually with respect to um, modeling collagen, but I would actually look into it. Uh, I've, so I know like forms, that. If I'm not wrong, collagen forms a lot of helices together, right? Yes, yeah, so it's, um, it's a trimer. And yeah, it, 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 yeah that, that's, that's kind of what I remember, like very long helices like kind of together and, and like three, three of them, right? Like that's, that's the... Yeah, so the secondary structure is a triple helical structure. And yeah. I know there's like a script that was created by actually Rainier Lab that depending right. on the sequence, you can build the structure um, of the triple helical peptides. So that's why I was planning to use that to run some MD and steered molecular dynamic simulations. Yeah, no, it's, it, yeah, it's totally possible. For pretty sure it's totally possible. And, and changing the sequence it, it is going to influence your uh, your results for sure, and, and how sensitive that is will depend a lot on many factors. But like we, we have studied systems like that, like a lot of them, and like like in this case that I was just talking about the the, the SARS CoV two, like the, the chimera that we created. That's a case where there's no structure, right? Like we create a new thing, and we were able to to get the, the, the results that were reproduced experimentally. Oh, okay, sure. Um, I guess if I have any questions in the future, I might. Oh, yeah, please shoot me an email. I, I can answer you, no problem. Sure, thank you. You have another question? Um, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, thanks for your nice presentation. My question is that, uh, you know, I have uh, done simulation with Gromax. Uh, there, we are familiar with VMD as visual molecular dynamics and only use VMD to see, for example, those uh, structures. Uh, but here in MD, um, the story uh, is different. I want to know the actual relationship between MD and VMD. Um, it seems that uh, VMD is also an engine for MD. But uh, I thought that uh, NAMD is going to perform the MD simulation. I want yes, to NAMD know uh, from the MD, what yes. part of the work is done with uh, NAMD at uh, what part with uh, VMD. I want to know that. Thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, the MD part is NAMD. The visualization part and analysis part is all done in VMD. But let's say you want to calculate something that's related to energy. You, you just bring NAMD back and calculate. The thing is, these two programs are developed in the same group, one next door to the other. So it's like it's the same people. We are in the same meetings. Are, it is this exact same place. It's just two different programs. So at the end of the day, they talk to each other a lot. But, you know, but it's uh, it's not like you are not like for instance, if you want to calculate energy of any kind of interaction from any point, there's a plugin in VMD that to do that, but it's going to use NMD. Even if you bring a trajectory from Gromax, it is going to use NEMD because that's NEMD is the engine behind, you know, like that's the engine that we, we develop. Uh, so, but basically the answer is that, you know, like NEMD does all the QA, all the, yeah, NEMD does all the 
MD, and in the MD, there's all the analysis and visualization parts. Thanks, Elias. Um, and the idea with QuickMD was to create a bridge, <laughs> to create an easy bridge. That was the, the point. Uh, okay, I am kind of done with my QuickMD part of the story, the older QuickMD part of the story. Let me share my screen again.